Good morning, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We're going to be starting here. It's great to have everybody here worshiping today. And again, welcome to those who are worshiping with us online today. It is great to have everybody here, and I hope that your summer is going well for you. At this time, let us listen to the prelude. Join silently together in mind and spirit and in heart for the opening prayer of blessing. Lord, we come into your presence this morning with the busy schedules of summer activities crowding our lives. God of forgiveness and new beginning, feed our hearts with compassion and nourish our souls with the bread of heaven, which is Jesus Christ. As Jesus fed the hungry crowds, knowing that they needed both physical bread and spiritual food, the bread of heaven, fill us with your generous spirit and make us one with Christ. Open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts this day to hear your words of hope and healing for us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And now let us worship God singing as the deer.
in the presence of the Lord. At this time, let us join together in praying the prayer of humility. Let us pray. God, you know how we are. Sometimes we seek bread for our bodies more than we seek the bread of heaven, Jesus Christ. Lord, we have forgotten your promise that you will fill us with the bread of life. We say that we will take time to refresh our spirits and our souls, and then we quickly crowd our lives with activities to the point of exhaustion. We turn to you for feeding and nurture, asking you to give us something to sustain us through our times. We even are willing to tell you what we have, but when we look closely, we discover that we bring so little to you. Take what we have, our gifts and our needs. Heal and forgive us for when we boldly disobey your word. Remind us that you have given to us and all that we need to serve you in this world. The world abounds with your miracles of love and hope. Open our eyes to see them and our hearts to know that these are from you and not of our own making. Heal and restore us by your everlasting love. Heal us now as we silently confess our sins to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us hear and believe the assurance of God's great love for us. Friends, rejoice, for the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. God will not always accuse, nor will God harbor anger forever. God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our sin. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who fear God. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. And friends, this is the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Now a reading from Exodus, from the New Revised Standard Version. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you who have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people should go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. 
In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And from Ephesians 4. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who was above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament from which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Before we hear the scripture um, expounded on and read, let us pray. Dear God, as we hear your word, may we be transformed into a community of believers ready to go into the world to testify that Christ is alive, real, and active in our lives today and always. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A reading from John 6, verses 24 through 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? 
Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from the heavens to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. This scripture narrative, it takes place after Jesus feeds the 5,000. And that was the sermon scripture that Pastor Lloyd preached on last Sunday. It was written in the scripture narrative that it accounted for men, the 5,000 that was, were fed. So it's possible that Jesus feeds more than just 5,000 people, but it could have been 10,000 or even 15,000 people or more, including women and children. So the crowd the next day after Jesus feeds the 5,000 began to look for Jesus when they noticed Jesus and his disciples were no longer there. In verse 25, the people looking for Jesus find Jesus. The crowd found Jesus on the other side of the sea. When the people in the scripture know to find Jesus, they have a question for him. They ask, when did you come here? Why did they ask Jesus this question? Maybe they did not see Jesus get into the boat with the disciples. So they possibly wanted to know if Jesus walked on the water. Or maybe they were upset. You see, they were trying to make Jesus an earthly king. They kept overlooking that Jesus was speaking to them about spiritual things and not earthly things. Have you ever been in a situation where you expect one thing to happen and then something else unexpected, unexplained, unplanned happens? It can turn your whole world and your life upside down. Then you have to begin to recalculate like a GPS in your car when you accidentally make a wrong turn. The GPS will recalculate the route for you and get you back in the right direction that you should be going. That is what we need the Holy Spirit for, to help us get back into the right direction. We have the end destination, which is heaven. We just do not have all the turns and stops as we live out our lives. But we can believe and know that we are being guided by the Holy Spirit. If you are unsure of where you are going now and you are looking for Jesus, you can ask God to give you a clear route, a day-to-day -day, or even moment-by-moment -moment guidance to follow. Continue to look for Jesus. You will find Jesus in unexpected places, but you have to be proactive. Sometimes in our faith journey, we seem to get into a drift mode. We just go on autopilot. We need to be mindful of our spiritual journey every day and be actively participating with the Lord. Jesus knows and sees where you are and is willing to meet you where you are to bring about transformation and change. Just like what Jesus does for the people in today's narrative, Jesus answers their questions with the truth. And Jesus will always answer our questions too. People are looking to be satisfied. It is part of every human being's life to look for something higher than oneself, something to worship, adore, and gravitate to. This has been placed in us by God. Some people find God, but others fall into temptation and habits that lead to death and destruction. Jesus tells the people straight out that they are looking for him for the wrong reasons. The people are looking for more miracles. They wanted more miracles that would benefit them physically. Sometimes as Christians, we can get this whole following Jesus mixed up. We can think that living this life as Christians mean, means we only need our physical lives taken care of. Maslow Hierarchy of Needs, which is a model that outlines human needs, written by Dr. Abraham Maslow, details what we as humans need. On the pyramid model, a Maslow hierarchy of needs, basic needs, psychological needs, and self-fulfillment needs are the focus. We have been taught this, but spiritual needs start at birth. Prior to any basic psychological or self-fulfillment needs are met. 
There are things we have been taught that need to be reframed in our Christian eyes or from a Christian point of view. So Jesus begins to redirect the people spiritually. Jesus instructs them. He instructs them not to work for the food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternity. What endures for eternity? In scriptures we find in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, these words. And these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So after all is said and done, it is, our only, it is only faith, hope, and love that will last. The love found in God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. It is our faith, hope, and love that are given to us. We cannot have faith, hope, and love in and of ourselves. These are a gift from God. Gifts we are to share with one another and not withhold or just have selfishly for me and mine. We will never be truly happy with temporal things. For just like Jesus has been sealed by God, we as Christians have been sealed too. What does it mean to be sealed? It means that we belong to God. A seal makes us authentic. In ancient times, a king had a ring that had a distinct design, a seal on it, that was recognizable. Something like a logo in today's world. The king would write a letter and then take hot wax from a candle and drip it on the flap of the letter to hold it down. Before the wax of the candle got cold, the king would push the emblem of his ring into it, leaving the impression of his ring. This would identify the letter as the letter straight from the king. The seal authenticated the letter. So you are not fake. You are not an imposter. You are not a wannabe Christian. You are real, dynamic, wonderfully made in the image of God. You are sealed by God. The people in the scripture narrative begin to understand a little bit and want to know what they must do to perform the works of God. Jesus answers them with, with what sounds like a very simple, easy answer. Jesus answers them saying, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. It is not many works with a plural ending used in the previous verse by the crowd. It is a singular work. Believe in God who has sent Jesus Christ. Do you believe in God who sent Jesus Christ? If you believe, then you will also believe and follow the one God sent, that is Jesus. This is a departure from what the people in the scripture narrative are used to hearing. They were used to hearing about obeying the laws and not believing in Jesus. So this is a difficult word for them. It took them off their center. Have you ever been taken off your center? If you have ever made pottery on a potter's wheel, then you know how important it is to make sure the clay is centered. If the clay is not centered on the wheel properly, the pot will be crooked. In Isaiah 64, 8, it reads, Yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. So the people in today's narrative, they were off center. They can believe in Moses who led the Israelites for 40 years, but to make a transition and believe in the promised Messiah, it is too much to even imagine. So they are going to ask for more signs. They want more signs in order to believe in Jesus as the promised Messiah. A sign is a natural experience that points to a spiritual reality. What signs do you need to believe in Jesus? It can be difficult to believe in Jesus without a sign. But we are not to put our hope and trust in signs, but in God. The thing is, God is so gracious and kind and loving that God sometimes gives us a sign. The people in today's scripture narrative begin to compare Jesus to Moses. They said that Moses fed their ancestors in the wilderness. Jesus, in comparison, fed 5,000 plus people. But Moses could have fed over 1 million, and not just for a couple of times, but for 40 years. So the people in today's narrative, they could have had serious issues of comparing Jesus to Moses. They are probably like, 
what is the big deal? Moses fed us, our ancestors, for 40 years in the desert. And here Jesus has only done this a couple of times. Jesus has to then correct them, for they are not correct about the history. And they keep going to the physical and overlooking the spiritual. How often do we do that? We look for the physical or the financial and forget about the spiritual aspects of life. Then Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Jesus speaks in the present tense, gives you, not the past tense, gave. God gives us bread from heaven. What is bread from heaven? Verse 33 tells us, for the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The bread of heaven gives life to the whole world, not death. And this life is Jesus. Of course, the people in today's narrative in verse 34 ask for this life-giving bread because they do not recognize Jesus as the bread of life. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. In the King James Version, the word sir, referencing Jesus, the word Lord is used. The use of the word Lord in the King James Version shows somewhat of a shifting and beginning of the people in today's narrative to understand spiritually what God is saying to them. So they start to begin to understand just a little bit more. Then Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is the bread of heaven, the bread of life. What they are looking for is right in front of them. Have you ever lost something? You spend time hunting all over the place for it. Then you realize what you are looking for was right in front of you the whole time. What we need and are looking for is right in front of us. It's Jesus. Jesus says, come and believe. Where are you spiritually? Are you growing spiritually each and every day of your life? Growing spiritually happens when we worship God, have the devoted prayer time and devotion time, listen to worship music, through hearing the word of God and opening our hearts and minds to the things of God and reframing things in a Christian point of view. Use your Christian eyes. Are you looking for Jesus or are you living your life on your own terms? We should wake up each morning looking for Jesus to be visible in our lives. We should pray and hope to see Jesus in our everyday activities. We should be looking for Jesus to speak, touch, and change our lives. Jesus tries to bring the people in today's narrative from seeking the physical to seeking the spiritual. God can and does the same for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And now let us continue to worship God with singing, open my eyes that I may see. Thank <laughs> you. 
You may be seated. We have two sacraments in the Presbyterian Church, baptism and communion, that use natural elements to confirm spiritual realities. Today we are going to partake of communion. This is an ancient meal that can be compared to the Jewish Passover meal. See, when we partake of communion, we eat and drink. We come and believe. We partake of the bread and the juice or the wine. We do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So we come and we believe that we will never be thirsty or hungry spiritually again because we believe in Jesus Christ, who fulfills our every need and then gives us gifts, talents, treasures, and times to go out and share with the world in living out our everyday lives so, the, so that others in turn will come and believe and share in the work of Jesus each and every day of their lives. Jesus takes those of us, God's people, who are looking for him in, in a physical sense to find Jesus in a spiritual sense. And now let us join together in a great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our Lord and God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise God. We ask that you would take these elements from a natural use and change them to a spiritual use, Lord God, that they will just edify the body and build us up spiritually, Lord God, so that we can go out and do the mighty work of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask this. Amen. On the night that Jesus was with the disciples for their Passover meal, he took the bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. In the same manner, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, and he said, this cup is the covenant, the new covenant poured out, my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins of many. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me.
At this time, we're going to have the dedication of the gifts and a pastoral prayer. Let us pray together. Lord, we come here today in fellowship with one another, setting aside this time only for you. Lord God, we ask that you will just open our spiritual eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear your word and hear you speaking to us. We ask you, Lord God, that you would increase our Christian eyes so that we can see all the beautiful things in this world that you're doing. And Lord God, help us to be able to identify those things when I of you and then reflect on how we can change this world. We offer you our praise and worship. We thank you that we can hear you speaking to us. And we pray, Lord God, that we can just leave this place a little bit more like you, Jesus. So we humbly and quietly come before you. God, we thank you for the times this week that we smiled and laughed, those times of friendship and joy, the meal shared, those times when we appreciated the beauty of nature, when we felt a peace in our hearts, when we paused to be grateful for the life you have given us. For all these and so much more, we know that we are blessed, and we in grateful joy give you thanks. For days of difficulty and struggle, for the times when we have been less than our best, we give you thanks that you do not turn away from us and that we are never left alone. You are always with us. The Bible tells us that when we confess our sins, you are gracious and just to forgive us and help us start anew. So we thank you for your mercy and grace. Lord, we lift up to you this church. We want First Presbyterian Church to be a strong and vital church in our community. We want to be used by you to make a difference in the lives of, of others. The need for hope, acceptance, love, and compassion is great. And you are the answer to those needs. Help us to show others the way to you through our programs, through our ministries, and most of all, through our lives and example. God, we pray that we, you will bless our tithes and offerings and talents. May they bring honor and glory to your name. We ask, Lord God, that you will just be with the Olympians at the Olympics. We pray that the Christian organizations that are there witnessing and giving support and encouragement to the athletes will just continue to be there and surround the athletes with love and acceptance. We pray for the athletes' mental, physical, and spiritual protection. Lord God, we pray for the wildfires that are going on out west. We ask, Lord God, that you will be with the firefighters as they are fighting those fires. Reduce those fires, Lord God, and bring, bring it to the place where we're able to plant trees to replace those that have been lost. Lord, for the sick, suffering, lonely, misguided, or just those in need of your presence, we ask that you would touch them with your healing touch with your guidance, with your peace. We have those on our prayer list and those that we receive text about and those on our hearts and minds that we pray for. So hear us now as we silently lift up the names of those for whom we ask your blessing. Lord, for the confidence and joy and hope we have because we walk daily with you. We give you thanks and praise in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and all the people of God, as one united people and voice by the power of the Holy Spirit, we say the prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
And now let us stand and sing, continue to worship God, singing in Christ, there is no east or west. the charge and benediction. Go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty. And now may the love of the Father, and the peace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in your hearts now and forevermore. Amen.